uh, I'm Dan Harris. I'm a Scala engineer at uh, Zyverge. Um, and so I'm going to talk about something that I've been slightly obsessed with um, recently. Uh, it's the idea of uh, execution plans in general, and specifically how we can create functional type safe execution plans with uh, Zio Schema. All right, so. Like, what do we actually mean by an execution plan? It's sort of a general term that can mean anything up to code itself, which is an execution plan of sorts, all the way down to something super specific like a Postgres query execution plan, which is you know very, very specific. Um, I mean something sort of in the middle there, right? So specifically, I think there's like four, four things that uh, sort of characterize the, what I'm talking about when I talk about execution plans. Um, so one, there should be a restricted set of computations, right? So we're not trying to solve, create sort of a universal Turing machine, right? We, we want to define a basic set, set of primitives that we can use to create complex uh, uh, computations through composition, but still give us uh, a reasonable basis to do sort of optimization. Um, it should be interpreted, right? So basically the execution plan itself should just be a data structure that describes uh, a, a set of computations rather than sort of being the computation itself. Uh, and to that end, it should be serializable, right? This should be a pure data structure. It, shouldn't, it should be completely separable from the runtime environment in which it's created. And most importantly, we wanna uh, basically creating an execution plan, we want to describe what, not how. That is, we want to sort of describe the outcome that we desire rather than sort of how to achieve that outcome through a sort of series of, of basic steps. Um, and sort of what, like what are we even talking about here? Like what problem is this, is this solving? Um, so let's, let's start with an example, which uh, unless you have freakishly good eyesight, you probably can't read. <laughs> So uh, I guess I'll describe it then. <laughs> so uh, imagine we have a bunch of employees. An employee's got a, you know, a name, a department, a country, and a salary. And we want to know for all of our employees in Spain, what's the average salary and the maximum salary by department, right? So if we have a get employees method that returns us all of our employees, you know, how we would do this in Scala, the easy way is like this thing on the left right here, right? You know, we filter by country of Spain, we group by department, and then we, you know, we do some computations to, to get our salary sets um, object at the end. So that works, it's great. If you don't have that many employees, it's, you know, efficient enough, but it's, it's also like, all kind of sucks, right? So, you know, that's a really efficient way to do this really inefficient way to do this computation, right? You're, you're sort of looping over everything and then you're looping over each group of employees twice to, to get the maximum and the, the average salary. Um, so if we wanted to sort of put our, uh, you know, premature optimization hats on, we could do something like on the right uh, where we sort of create an aggregation buffer and we're sort of creating this buffer as we loop over all the employees and then at the very end, we sort of have everything in this buffer and then we can do some, you know, some last minute computations to produce our result. So that's faster, it's more efficient, but it, it sucks in its own way too because like the code is just kind of nasty, right? It's, uh, it's not very extensible, it's not very composable, uh, like you wouldn't want to maintain this. Um, so, you know, th there's gotta be a better way, right? And like the, the one obvious better way <laughs> is to just write a SQL query, right? So if we did this in a SQL query, this is all we have to do, right? Select department, max salary, average salary from employees, or from employees where country is Spain, group by department. Uh, and this is great if our data is in a relational database, right? So this sort of checks all of our boxes for an execution plan, right? It's, it's serializable, it's uh, interpreted, right? The, you're just creating the query and then you're sending it off to the database server, which is what actually figures out how to run this, and is declarative. You're describing the data set that you want, not how to construct this data set from the underlying database data. Um, and sort of 
under the hood, um, the way that uh, you know a SQL engine is going to actually do this efficiently without us having to specify the most efficient way to do it is it's going to sort of turn this query into uh, a logical plan or a ex logical execution plan, which is really just kind of like an AST of the SQL query, right? It's, it's based, take the SQL query, parse it to an AST, and you've got your execution plan. But there's another step in which it looks at that plan and it's going to figure out, all right, now I've got this, how do I actually execute this efficiently? And it's going to you know, pull a bunch of optimization tricks to rewrite that original logical plan into an optimized logical plan. But you probably can't read that one either. So basically, it's going to do, uh, it's going to do things like uh, uh, predicate and projection push down. So instead of reading the entire employees table into memory, it's going to push our predicate filter uh, country equals Spain all the way down to the table scan. So if, if there are indexes or other metadata, it can use that to limit the amount of data it reads from disk. And it's going to push the projections that we care about down. So if this table has 1,000 columns or whatever, it doesn't matter because it's only going to read the two that we actually care about. Um, and then it's going to do some other stuff, right? This isn't a real execution plan. This is sort of a, a stylized thing for, <laughs> for demonstration purposes. Um, but, but the point is, is that you know, we, we, as the developer, we just describe what we want, right? We want this particular data set. And we let the execution engine figure out how to execute this efficiently. And it's really, really good at executing it efficiently. Um, but this is, the data has to be in a relational database, right? And the, uh, not all data lives in relational databases, unfortunately, right? Data's in APIs, data's behind GraphQL services, data's all over the place. So certain cases we can't just like, all right, I'm gonna do a SQL query on this and call it a day. Um, so like, what would this look like to apply this same sort of principle in a Scala API? So this is gonna be sort of a sketch of what this might look like. All right, so we start with a plan. A plan, if that type signature looks familiar, then that's basically just a function one, right? So a plan is just a function from Q to R, right? It takes some input, produces an output. Um, and this is nice because this thing sort of, from the type system standpoint, is just a function. So it's gonna compose like a function. And we're gonna be able to do, use all those fancy functional tricks that we love as, as functional developers. Um, and then we can sort of define how we want to sort of modify this plan um, to sort of build up our overall execution plan, right? So we, we start with our sort of base level and then we're going to apply a bunch of stages which are effectively just functions we're applying on each stage of the plan, right? So we can filter, right? If our plan produces a list of our ones, we can uh, apply a filter predicate, which is just a plan, aka a function, from R1 to Boolean, and that predicate's gonna apply to each, each value output by its input plan and sort of filter it out if it doesn't match the predicate, right? We can project, which is gonna be sort of a map function, right? It's gonna map our R1s to R2s so that we can pick individual fields out of our input plan. Um, and then we're gonna, we can group by, right? So we can define a group by key, which is gonna map each, each element to some value K, and then we're gonna produce a map where each, uh, each sort of row in our output set is gonna get sort of rolled up under the same key. And then, uh, you know, add a, a helper here to, to help my example. Uh, we can do a group aggregate, right? So that's sort of doing everything in one step. It's grouping by a particular key, and then it's going to perform aggregations on, on, the, uh, on the values. And why does it have two? Why does it add one and add two? Well, this is just an example, so that's what I needed to, uh, to, to finish the example. But in reality, it would be <laughs> better. <laughs> um, all right, so we can define a plan, but we still need a way to sort of tie this to our actual domain model and actual Scala types, right? So this is sort of where the machinery that we have in Zio Schema can sort of allow us to do this in a, in a nice and sort of type safe way. 
So Zeo Schema gives us access to these things, you know, we call rarefied optics, which is a pure data representation of uh, sort of traditional functional optics, right? So we take uh, something like a lens, which is kind of just a function from a type to a field within that type, and we give, we give you a sort of uh, a way to uh, represent that in a, in a pure data serializable way. Um, so that's sort of like a projection, right? So we can create this thing called a selector, which is basically just a lens, but as pure data, and we can turn that into a plan, right? It's just a plan from our super type to our, uh, our field type, and then we can add some, some nice helpers on that, right? So we can create uh, you know, uh, filter predicates with our little equals method there. We can, we can create a max function, which is gonna take a list of S's and give us the maximum value of that particular field in that uh, list. And we can do our sort of average as long as our A is some sort of, uh, some sort of numeric type. Um, and like you see in the implementation here, we're just, you know, this is just like, uh, you know, equals, and then it returns a predicate equals, and like th th there's no implementation there, right? This is just data. This is just a description of what we actually want to do. The, the, the actual implementation would be on the interpreter side. Um, so what is the, putting all this together, what does it actually look like? All right, so we have our employees. We use our Zeo schema machinery to, to get a schema and sort of extract our reified optics. We have uh, a data source that produces employees, which you know, we'll leave the implementation as an exercise to the reader. And then we can sort of represent our uh, Scala implementation before as a, something that looks a lot more just like regular SQL, right? We can do employees.filter, employee.country is Spain, group aggregate by department, and we're gonna look at the salary max and the salary average. Right, so we get something that can, is basically just a pure data representation of that execution function, but written in Scala and sort of type safe and composable. Um, and there's some sort of additional benefits to this, right? So uh, we can, you know, we're, we're decoupling the application from the execution environment, which means that we can actually delegate some computations to sort of highly optimized native compute kernels using st something like Apache Arrow, right? So there, there's some things that the JVM is really, really good at, uh, but there's some things you can't do as efficiently as you could in sort of native code, right? You can't do vectorized operations in, in, uh, in the JVM world like you can in, in a sort of native world. And also the sort of how you take an execution plan and distribute it across uh, a cluster of machines becomes again something that you can sort of leave as a as a implementation detail in the execution environment instead of having to sort of rewrite your code. Right? You can take that the same execution plan and you can execute it on a single server and process, or you can send it to a cluster. And the sort of uh, and sort of there's there are ways to sort of take that and sort of distribute it across a cluster of machines without describing the original execution plan any differently. All right, and that is it. Thanks to uh, everyone for coming in. Uh, Zio Schema. You can find out more um, by going to our GitHub here, or uh, if if none of that reified optic stuff made any sense whatsoever, uh, I did a talk at Functional Scala, which kind of starts from the beginning and explains that. Uh, and I'm on uh, you know, Twitter and GitHub, so if you have any questions or anything, um, you know, feel free to reach out. Thanks, everyone.